Thank you. Aniket, why the, in the video, na, when we started how to sit and how to get up and how to adjust the seat, he was the student. Now he is a femtosurgeon. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pratyush, for including me in this uh, IC. <coughs> so I'll be completing the journey which we started with ECC now. And uh, we all know now that cataract surgery is rapidly being transformed into a precise refractive surgery. And uh, premium IELTS actually includes any non-conventional monofocal and presbyopia correcting IELTS. Uh, let's pay tribute to Sir Harold Ridley for one of the most important developments in the history of cataract surgery for the patient, basically, than us. And uh, the ideal intraocular lens should actually restore vision at all distances, uh, especially now with uh, smart dashboards, computers, tablets, mobiles, our intermediate distance and near mm -hmm. distance has come mm -hmm. more into prominence. So traditional lenses, so, yeah. the best case scenario was that it was good for vision, uh, for distant vision, uh, whereas uh, <coughs> an excellent option for patients from 45 to 60 is when they want distance for intermediate and near. And that is why these days most energy and funding is probably on the development of new and complex IELTS. Uh, for the premium IEL technology, the bio, the bio material used should be uh, compatible inside the eye and also for the capsule especially. Uh, hydrophobic acrylic material present the highest level of adhesiveness uh, and also expected that the anterior and posterior capsule fuse with the IL and prevent decentration which is important. The square edge of the optic in the premium IL are designed to prevent uh, capsular opacification. The toric IELs uh, with a larger overall diameter eventually have uh, a good uh, rotational stability. Uh, aspheric IELs which match more closely to the shape and optical quality of the human natural lens and provide better vision quality and therefore some authors even include monospheric, uh, monofocal aspheric IELs also as a premier IELs. Premier IEL basically implies an aspheric IEL with uh, different optical characteristics to correct the to, uh, accommodation and also the astigmatism. So the premium IELs include toric IELs, multifocal IELs and accommodative IELs. We'll discuss today more about toric and multifocals which I'm practicing. Uh, approximately one-fifth of our patients have an astigmatism more than 1.25 and if you take more than one then it becomes around 30 percent of the population. So the different uh, cylindrical correction range is present by different companies. Platform it doesn't matter much over a period of time it's come to know that both provide uh, quite equal rotational stabilities. The vast majority of the patients in fact do extremely well when careful attention is paid to the patient, lens selection, the surgical technique. Of course, in patients with IELTS, misalignment is an important factor. Studies between 2 to 10 percent have shown to have a rotational uh, instability. It can be a result of uh, I mean, improper alignment during surgery or also post-op. Uh, multifocal IELTS are classified according to the optical principle that it serves basically refractive multifocal IELTS on the refraction principle, uh, diffractive multifocal IELTS on the interference and optic wavefronts. Uh, refractive multifocal IELTS, they have different annulus designs from center outside, one for distance, one for near with an aspheric design. And uh, a rotationally symmetrical uh, refractive multifocal IELTS that are presently present in the market are array and resume. And this is a rotationally asymmetrical IELTS where the near uh, ad is on the inferior half. Uh, one of the limitations of refractive multifocal IELTS are of course because it has to be placed in some particular order, it's pupil dependent, a high sensitivity of lens centration and the usual problem with all multifocals because the light rays are divided. You have halos, glares, and loss of contrast sensitivity. Uh, diffractive multifocal IELTS are a combination of a monofocal optic and a diffractive element. Uh, we all have a monofocal optic that gives a basic power for distance. Uh, we have a diffractive that divides the light into distance and near. And uh, when you combine this, uh, then you get uh, something called as a multifocal IELTS. Diffractive multifocal IELTS that give either a bifocal to near and distant or in, if you add an intermediate, it becomes a trifocal. So most of the light is deviated for distance and near, and approximately more than 20% of the light here is lost. And that is why we have loss in contrast sensitivity in most of the multifocal IELTS. The width actually uh, tells us, governs the addition uh, for the multifocal IELTS. as a concept of apodization where as you go toward the periphery, the height of the uh, steps starts decreasing so the purpose for that is when the pupil dilates in the mesopic conditions it becomes a near distant IOL 
with not much loss of contrast and a good halos and uh, control over halos and uh, photic phenomena. So these are the diffractive bifocals that are present at present in the market. Uh, trifocal IOLs, you take uh, two bifocal IOLs, one for distance near, other for distance intermediate, and it gives you third uh, point of an intermediate IOL, uh, intermediate point. So these are the different trifocal IOLs that have been present in the market. Uh, to add to that, to add a continuum of foci through the implementation of spherical aberration, basically uh, in the presence of these trans, to have a continuous transition zone instead of three different points, you have the IDA of IOLs or the extended depth of focus. And uh, as an extended depth of focus is created, the quality of intermediate vision, a light diffraction that elongates the focus, gives a continuous vision. These are the extended depth of focus IELs that are present. So this is what are the multifocal IELs, your bifocals, trifocals, and, ex uh, and extended depth of focus. But do they really work in the eye, as claimed by the, uh, as claimed by the people there? So this is where the defocus curve comes into picture to tell us about the expected visual outcome of an IOL. So if you take into consideration a uh, young adult with less than 30 years with crystalline, you have a good vision for far, intermediate, and near, whereas if you take monofocal IOLs, excellent vision for far, as in as you keep going away, then the distance and then the vision becomes poor. A bifocal IOL usually has a V shape of uh, the defocus curve, good far, poor intermediate, and a good near vision. Uh, this is where trifocal IOL comes into uh, existence. The good far, good far, uh, decent intermediate that helps you at around exactly at 60 centimeters to 80 centimeters and, and, uh, exp and uh, probably an expected near vision we, we should be satisfied with. When it comes to EDOF IOLs, EDOF IOLs produce a smooth un uninterrupted and dome shaped defocus and they have an intermediate vision which is uh, slightly better compared to a trifocal but uh, it loses on when it comes to a near vision uh, for trifocals. So this is what is to summarize the trifocals and EDOFs have a better uh, intermediate vision and EDOFs have a better in intermediate vision in mesopic conditions. Near vision is better with bifocals and trifocals. And of course, uh, contrast and optic phenomena is something we all have to deal with, even with newer uh, trifocals, though they are less, but they are still present and people do adapt after a period of one to two months. Um, some studies have showed better contrast with EDOF compared to trifocals, but others have found it equivocal. We all have to bear with glare and halos. This is something that is more common with bifocals and trifocals because that is a property of interference and diffraction you can't go away with. Coming to patient dissatisfaction, you, if you see that most common point is blurred vision and ametropia. You have to have a very good pre-op evaluation so that you give ametropia for distance. If you give ametropia for distance, then rest of the focal points are taken into consideration. I'll quickly go to my second part, uh, which is flax. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Samar Basak is waiting, so I'll just rush through my slides. Just a couple of videos. Yes, sir. Uh, five, ten minutes. I'll just small, small, small. Minutes. Yeah, yeah. Just two to three minutes. That's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Samar Basak, just a couple of minutes. I'll just. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for making you wait. So this is a new addition to our cataract armamentarium. That is a femtosecond laser-assisted cataract surgery. These are the futures which everyone knows. It acts as a laser blade basically, causing photo disruption and dissection. Multiple commercially available in the market. Uh, we at our center have Lensex. So this is a platform that's got a good imaging system, a patient interface, a femtosecond laser. Earlier, lots of contraindications which have slowly become uh, possible now with the advancement in technology, but still some contraindications remain. And femtosecond laser assisted has as it gives precise and reproducible results with compared to capsular axis and uh, lens. So these are a few of the things that are to be done. Docking is something that is important because you have to centrate the 
uh, I, that is when next steps becomes easier for you, basically the capsulotomy and the lens fragmentation. This is how the OCT comes, live OCT. This is a live OCT, 3D OCT. This is nothing of a animated part. It gives you a real-time OCT right from the anterior surface of the cornea to the posterior surface of the lens in one picture from top to bottom. And, uh, sorry. Video is not playing. Sorry, ma'am. So this is how it appears when you are uh, doing it uh, live. You got the capsular exercise, the fragmentation size, the placement of the incisions, and once uh, everything is decided and we start the application of laser, then you have the first capsular excess, perfect central capsular excess, uh, then uh, followed by the lens fragmentation. You can have either a French fry cut, a pizza cut, whatever you want, so that it becomes easier for you. Then after this, then you have the incisions, the main incision, followed by the two side incisions. If you plant an LRI, then it gives a precise LRI. And just a video to show. Plenty of rain. Yeah. This is just to show uh, how easier it becomes to take out the capsule. You just have to use a capsular excess forceps and drag it out. And then uh, when you begin the FACO process, uh, most of your uh, chop is already done, you have to just do, uh, slightly separate it at the place where there is dissection and then most of the pieces come to your probe directly uh, without even bothering to chop and go anything deeper further. Especially, uh, I'll just try to wind this up now, Dr. Basik is waiting, especially in case of hard cataracts, subluxated cataracts, intumescent cataracts, cataracts where you feel that you want to use special instruments, CTRs, uh, capsular hooks, so once the capsular excess is done in a subluxated cataract, it becomes more easy to use all those things. And we, thought, we talked about the premium IOL where it is more important to have good centration, good dial, stability, and that is when if you combine with the flax, it gives you excellent results. Thank you.